Hello, everyone. I'm Lasagna Thompson with the Interfaith Film and Music Festival, and we have an exciting guest with us. And we will allow our guest to tell us a little bit about himself, his film, and um, more about his journey as a filmmaker. Anthony, take it away. Hi, so thank you for your invitation. I'm really glad. So, um, so I'm Anthony Chen. I'm 36 years old. I'm, as you can hear, I'm French. So I'm currently in the south of France. Uh, I often travel abroad to, to the US, especially for my documentaries. I have a YouTube channel uh, about uh, mainly about near-death experiences, mystical experiences, uh, the nature of, the, of our consciousness, the nature of the mind. And uh, started to make this documentary, Who We Are, uh, about two years ago more than two years ago and it took me almost two years to to finish this uh, this project it has uh, seven speakers and it's about well it's about who we are it's about uh, what is the real nature of uh, of the self beyond the body beyond the emotions beyond the the personal story we all have so what happens when we die uh, what uh, how can we change the subconscious beliefs that we have? So I interviewed uh, a famous in, a near death experience account, Anita Morjani. Uh, she also had a miraculous healing just after her near death experience. And then I, I did a lot of, uh, yes, seven in total, seven interviews for these projects, uh, scientists, doctors, uh, all kinds of specialists. So yes, it's a very large topic. And uh, uh, I don't know what else I can say that might interest your audience. Uh, well, I think that it's really important also to understand that you put a lot of time into this film. And uh, was that time more in the research and development process or was it more in raising money and um, building up a team? Like, tell us why so long? Yes, um, I decided to fund this documentary myself. So, uh, because I, I wanted to have a lot of flexibility, I wanted, I didn't want to have a deadline uh, and I needed time to improve the overall idea I, I had about this documentary. So uh, I've spent a lot of time to research online, uh, online conferences. I've read a lot of books about these topics. Uh, and then it took me a few months to, to shoot the documentary. So I had to travel to UK to five different states in the, in the, in the US, it's, uh, including New York State. So that took me a long time. And I, um, then it took me also a very long time to edit this project, uh, a few months. And I wanted to, to do it this way. I, I could have, uh, how can I say? I could have chosen the, the option to, to have someone, a company to fund me or, you know, uh, to do a video on demand uh, system on my own website or on other websites. But I wanted to make this documentary this way and also to put it on my YouTube channel this way for free right away because I, want, I wanted to build my audience in the English speaking world. So that was my main uh, objective. So who are you finding um, that are, is gravitating towards your content uh, for near-death experiences? Are you getting any particular religion like uh, Christians or Buddhists or Muslims, um, people who are atheists? Like who's, who, or do you even know? Um, do people share that information with you? Uh, not all people share this information, but 
um, it's really cross religions, I would say. Um, people from all over all over the world are sending me emails about the, this documentary right now. Uh, in India, in the, in the U.S., in South America, in the in Africa, in Asia, Japan. So uh, it's really it's not a, a one religion a one religion thing. Sorry, this uh, this project. I think it cross it crosses a lot of uh, cultures. Yes. Which I think is really uh, critical in terms of putting together content um, to really make an impact. And with that uh, being the case, what uh, did you experience in terms of um, res resources that you needed that you didn't anticipate? What was some of the surprises that you had to overcome um, as uh, you went along the journey? Uh one surprise was that uh, it happens a lot in this process is that I had to change of speakers. I, I, uh, at first I had like uh, nine speakers. So at the very last uh, minute, I decided to take out two speakers and to add a new one. So I had to, to come up with more money and more energy to travel to uh, a new place to interview this person in the end. So, you know, and generally there, there are a lot of uh, extra costs for this kind of project, you know, you, you always need more money. <laughs> so uh, you never have, you never have uh, enough money to, to do what you want to do, I think. <laughs> Absolutely. And was there a time that you took a break or that you just needed to like get yes. a time out? Like describe that experience. Yes, I, um, I had to adjust to, because I don't, I didn't have an unlimited budget. So I have to, I had to adjust a few times and make a, take a break and wait a few weeks to, to do a, another travel to, to, to shoot the documentary. Yes. Um, it's, uh, yeah, it's, um, I think that when we don't have enough money or the money we would like to have, we, we can be more creative and overcome these problems. You know, there is always a way to overcome all the problems, especially with today's technology. We can do many, many things with little, but we have to be creative. So, and we have to be flexible with time, you know, and patient. So that's a, a whole process. Oh, well, that is um, reassuring for some people because it can be overwhelming at times um, when yeah. you really want to give birth. And it seems like the baby is just never going to come. Um, but in your instance, um, to get the baby out to the widest audience, you mentioned that you would put it on your YouTube channels, you're doing the festival circuits, but what else are you trying to get to uh, the universities um, because of the educational component? Are you getting to the religious institutions or NGOs? Like what's the strategy to continue to keep life in your project? Uh, I, I didn't try the, the religion uh, institutions because uh, usually most of them, they want to have their own uh, way of explaining this kind of spiritual things. So, But uh, I have someone in Japan who is uh, broadcasting this documentary to a, a, a university. I don't remember the name of the Japanese university, but it's, uh, it's happening. Um, and uh, also I have the option to, to sell the rights to some websites, online websites such as Gaia.com, you know. Um, so, but uh, again, for this one, I think the best option for me was to just 
to to bet on the on YouTube to bet on the uh, the biggest audience possible, and then uh, I I also have people in South America who are who are willing to to broadcast it to some schools. So yes, but it's so much work to to manage the you know the distribution process of uh, these kind of projects. You know, like it's I cannot do everything <laughs> like uh, alone. It's uh, it's a uh, it's a real job, you know. <laughs> Absolutely, um, which is so critical when you're putting together your budget that at some point you will have to get some experts also yes. um, to come to the table because they have the connections and they can just pick up the call or send an email and things just open up like a Pandora's box. But at least, you know, you're continuing to persevere with whatever resources that you have. And with that being the case, this project, did it happen um, at any point uh, during the pandemic or, you know, were you, um, you know, through and just kind of yeah. editing? What was happening for you with this film? Well, I had the chance to finish the the shooting of the documentary right just before the beginning of the pandemic. So like uh, two months before. And so I had everything in, in stock. Well, excepting one interview, but it's a long story. So, but I have, I had almost everything in, in stock before the pandemic. And then during the the pandemic last year, uh, I used the pandemic time, you know, the lockdowns, I used the time to start editing this big project. So I was kind of lucky. And since then I do, I did a lot of other projects. And what I do now is I, um, I am able to pay people, uh, for example, for instance, in the US to film people at home, at their home with professional equipment and cameras. And I ask the questions through uh, Zoom connection, like uh, like now, you know. And uh, then in the editing process, I edit out my questions. So in the final editing, no one notices that I'm not even here physically with the speaker, you know. So that's why I I can avoid some troubles because it's harder right now to to travel everywhere, you know. So that that's... is a good tip. Uh, and what do you recommend um, to filmmakers in terms of preparing um, for, you know, let's just say a perpetual infinite pandemic? Like, what should we be doing as filmmakers to be smarter? I think what it depends what kind of projects you would like to come up with, but. If you want to do something really professional, you can do this way, like uh, hire some people uh, you want to, to in the location to where you want to shoot and have people uh, film for you so, so that you don't have to, to travel everywhere all the time. Um, I think also we now have very good uh, webcams, you know, the quality of the, some very expensive uh, webcams are really, really good. So that's a way you can have to film people uh, remotely. So that, I don't know, it's just on, on the top of my mind like that, but I think it's, uh, there are many, many ways to adapt to this, uh, to this situation. Um, and the technology is really efficient right now, so we can, we have many options. That's my, uh, what I'd like to say. And thank you for um, giving that advice and insight um, to up and coming and emerging filmmakers, but then those who um, are also looking at how can they still give quality product at the same time, um, giving something that um, people can connect with and you said it it's also in the editing room so that's important to know and yeah. um so we've covered a good amount of uh information anthony were there any uh, last minute statements that you wanted to make to the audience um that's listening to you 
Um, let's say what I what I had in mind. Okay, uh, just wanted to you know make sure that I, our audience knows that um, with the Interfaith Film and Music Festival, filmmakers uh, such as Anthony are um, top notch. Um, they put a uh, lots of energy, time, uh, money, and resources and creativity into making their projects go live. And um, we hope that other filmmakers will be inspired to talk about yeah. touchy subjects such as faith, spirituality, near death, death, um, post death, um, and what it means to uh, us that are still here alive on earth. So thank you, Anthony, for um, interviewing with us. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I, I hope it, it was uh, good for you. <laughs> and sorry for my uh, French accent also. No, I lost my English. <laughs> Long time ago, right? No, we enjoy it. That's all about the variety, okay. the tossed salad. So we want for you to have a very productive um, film um, year. And then we look forward to any new projects that you have down the road. Okay, yeah, great. Uh, thank you for uh, this invitation. Again, it's a great idea to have this kind of uh, overhaul uh, festival of, about faith and uh, beliefs people can have, because I think we, we are in search of meaning right now. We lost a kind of a spiritual connection and we need that in our lives. Absolutely. Anthony, how does the audience get in contact with you one more time? Uh, it's uh, I, it, through my website, anthonychen.com. Uh, also, you can uh, go on YouTube and find my YouTube channel easily with my name, Anthony Chen. So, yeah. Wonderful. Well, you have a great remaining of the year. Thank you. You too. Okay. Thank take you. care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.